Thank you. And I'm not going to say I don't like UHPC, but I am going to say that there are some some good and bad lessons learned in this presentation. So I appreciate, and you mentioned this in the in the beginning, that we're allowed to share our successes and failures. So we're going to see both in that presentation today. Um, I did this research with my colleagues, Raid um, Al-Rashidi, who's here, and my advisor, Dr. Riding, and also Rami, who is back in Saudi Arabia, but did a lot of work on mixed design as well for us. So I'll talk about our project and the goals that we had going into it. This is a Department of Transportation, um, sorry, Florida Department of Transportation project. And their goals were to get UHPC made out of local Florida materials. And you can see on the second point, we wanted a range of compressive strengths and it's 12 to 21, it's actually 12 to ab above 21 KSI. And you might be thinking that's not really a UHPC compressive strength range. And I, I understand that. So our goals were to have um, four different mix designs, one from 12 to 15 KSI, one from 15 to 18 KSI, one 18 to 21 KSI, and then one stronger than 21 KSI. And we wanted that range of compressive strengths and I know a lot of those wouldn't be considered UHPC because that typically starts around the either 17 KSI or 21 KSI point, depending on who you ask. But I will be focusing more on those stronger mix designs because that's what we had the most trouble with, understandably. So we wanted to then look at our different mix designs and the different compressive strengths and see how those compressive strengths affected the mechanical properties and durability properties. Here's a good uh, diagram to also show that why that was. In the state of Florida, there are a lot of specifications for concrete that don't really cover any compressive strengths in between what is proprietary UHPC, and Florida does have a specification for proprietary UHPC, and then they have a lot of specifications for normal concrete, but there's so much concrete in between that could be very useful for things, so that's where our project is, and on the upper end, those are going to be more non-proprietary UHPCs. So uh, the last presentation covered particle packing really well. So if you are there for that, you have a good idea of why this is important for UHPC. We wanna reduce the voids between our particles. That really gives us good compressive strength. A lot of mix design is focusing on these properties of the concrete, how much space is between the particles. And when we're trying to also reduce the water content of our mixes, better particle packing will typically result in a, a lower water demand because in order for the mixture to flow, you don't need so much water to space out your particles. All right, this is our general mix design procedure. And this I would say is a, is a positive. This was a good way to make a lot of concrete batches. We started with small batches and just looked at the flow of the concrete and that was the mixer we used. And when we looked at the flow, we were targeting between seven and 10 inches in diameter using the flow test that was actually described really well in the first presentation here. So then we took mixes that had good flows and we did them in a little bit larger batches. And then we looked at the compressive strengths of those at 28 days. And we were trying to get those target values that I said earlier, a range of compressive strengths. And if we got one that was within one of those ranges, if it was you know between 18 and 21 KSI, we would use that for our research and then do further tests on that and that was our 18 to 21 KSI mix. That's the last step. Uh, so the first lesson, this is actually <laughs> our moderator's diagram, and this is a very good paper. I would recommend you read if you are trying to do non-proprietary UHVC mix design. Um, this is the lesson that took me the longest to learn uh, because I don't know about you, but in my concrete materials class, I was taught that if you lower your water content, you get stronger concrete. And that was really drilled into my brain. And as civil engineers who work with concrete, we, we really think that this is like the golden rule of concrete strength is less water, less water. But when we're using UHPC, we're at such a low water content. Not all of our, our cement is even reacting with the water in there. And you just don't get as clear of a trend. So I, I love this diagram uh, from this paper that shows it. And even though I had seen it, it still, while I was doing mixed design, it was hard for me to convince myself and also to convince um, my advisors, the people on my project, that maybe the answer to a stronger concrete isn't always reducing the water content. And this really caused us some problems. And you can even see, this is our, our version of this graph where we're looking at our trial mixes. So we did some seven day compressive strengths to, to help learn about our mixes a little bit faster. 
than waiting 28 days, but you can, you can see a similar trend, which is no trend. So this caused a few problems. First of all, sometimes we tried to get such low water contents that we were adding so much admixtures and we actually didn't get our concrete setting at one day because we had way too much admixture in there. And then second of all, we were really reluctant to make some changes that could have improved our compressive strength, but we didn't want to do it because, oh, we have to add more water and that's, that's bad. So using finer sands or more silica fume, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And we'd get into this, this rut. So if you start on the top right, we think, oh, our mix has too much water. And then, so we'd reduce the water and then we'd get bad flow. So we add super plasticizer and then we didn't get set because we had so much admixture. And so we'd add accelerator, but accelerator reduced the flow. So then we'd add water and we'd back to where we started. But if we had just gotten rid of our idea that our mix had too much water, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been stuck in this design issue. So the second lesson sort of ties into that. Finer materials would typically increase the strength, but also the water demand. So we were reluctant to do this. Certain things like finer sand gradation we tried and it was giving us good strengths, but we thought, oh, we have to use more water, that's bad. And then same thing with silica fume. Silica fume, as we know, is, is good for concrete strength, but it uh, would often increase the water demand. One thing that we did was switching to white silica fume did help this. We didn't see a change in the strength, but we did get an improvement in flow when we switched to white silica fume. And then using some filler materials also helped us with strength a lot. So our initial mixes didn't have filler materials because it's not really a local Florida material. And that was really our goal, but it did help with the compressive strength. So for the stronger mixes, we did need to use filler material. This shows our gradation. You can look, our silica fume is the blue line. That one, you know, due to agglomeration, it's hard to always get your silica fume particle size. So there probably should not be that second increase there. Um, but that compared to the white silica fume, which is the solid orange line, you can see a big difference in particle size. And then um, you can look at the silica flower, which is our filler material that we use. That's the orange dashed line. So you can see that's a really low particle size, which helped us with our strength. All right. Um, lesson three is that ice replacement was a really good I'm gonna say low cost fix for a lot of our issues. And I was, as a student, reluctant to use ice because I didn't wanna go buy and crush up ice every time we mixed concrete. But once I did it, it helped with a lot of the issues we were having. So we did a 75% replacement of water with ice and we got increased flow. We got cooler concrete, which makes sense, but um, I guess I didn't realize how much that higher temperature concrete was probably impacting our flow. And then we also decreased the amount of time needed for the mix to turn over. If you've mixed UHPC, you know that it takes a pretty long time to actually get to the fluid state that you're looking for. And using ice helped us to get there faster. All right, lesson four was um, a big wake up call for me, I would say. And it was just how much our mixing procedure impacted our results. So I, oh, sorry. Um, I have here, flow values on the bottom from the um, mini flow test. And these are all the same mix design that we did in different mixes. So different batch sizes, different mixers sometimes had different speeds, different mixing energies, different times required. And we got a huge difference in our flow values. And ideally you'd hope that this trend would be the same for all of the UHPC mixes, but that wasn't the case. So we had some mixes that would actually like, do better in this, um, in the second mix than the last mixer or some that would do worse, you know? And so it, it wasn't easy for us to understand the trend of what was happening because different mix designs would be better in different mixers. So um, based on that, the lesson that I learned was that instead of the mix procedure that I talked about earlier, what I would like to add in is this um, number three. And that's instead of taking the, um, the mixes that did well at the 28 day strength and saying, okay, those are our mixes. We're gonna use that for all of our tests. First, we should have redone that mix in the full size mixer that we planned on using for those tests. And we didn't do that. So we had some issues where, oh, this mix did really well in our trial mix and we got a good strength, but then we did it in a large scale mixer. And now we're getting higher flow and our fibers are segregating and we had to redo some stuff because of that. So that would be my suggestion. If you do have to do 
um, a lot of mixes for your research, make sure you do it in the same exact mixer with the same size. It's, it uses a lot of concrete, but it would have saved us some time. This is still about mixing procedure. We uh, found that the best flow occurred when admixtures were added after the water was added. This um, is supported in a lot of research. Again, it might depend on your specific mix design. That's what we found. And in, in a couple cases where we had higher flow than are expecting, if we added the um, admixtures mixed in with the water beforehand, that reduced the flow. That makes sense. Keep it in the back then. Um, okay. And then one surprise that happened was some of our admixtures reacted with each other. We typically batched our admixtures the day before, and sometimes we batch them all together in one admixture container of three different admixtures, and that wasn't giving us problems, but we switched admixtures, and something that happened is it turned this dark color. You can see those two pictures on the bottom. The left one was batched the day before. The right one is the exact same stuff, batched the day of. And they have different colors, and not only that, but the first mix never even turned over. It got really hot, and it just stayed this clumpy powder. And then the second one had great flow. So that was something that surprised me. But in hindsight, you know, I shouldn't have mixed the admixtures together and let them sit overnight, because that caused some definite flow issues. OK, um, cement type was found to have a really high impact on on our concrete. I said originally we wanted to use local Florida materials and Florida is really pushing the type one L cement because it is more environmentally friendly. It's gonna have a, a limestone replacement in there. That's the L. So it's not pure cement. It's got ground up limestone mixed in. And that was not giving us the uh, strengths that we needed. We couldn't really get above 19 KSI with that. So we switched to a type three cement. You can see the gradation. Those are the two dashed black lines are the cements. So the type three cement did have a finer gradation. This is a cement developed, you know, specifically for early age strength. So we were able to get the stronger strengths when we switched our cements. Okay, heat treatment had an impact on strength. And I think that is obvious for UHBC. If you, if you read literature about how heat treatment affects UHBC, you know that steam, steam cured UHBCs always have higher compressive strength. But because we were doing some mixes that weren't quite UHPCs, they were sort of in this intermediate range. What we found is that that didn't hold true for our other concretes. We got this crossover effect, which you can see at two days strengths, the steam cured ones, and I'll just say the precast cured ones were um, meant to mimic the temperatures that concrete at a precast plant would experience out in the field. So it's these elevated temperatures really early on due to the heat from cement and just being outside in Florida, we got higher than 150 degrees internally measured from that. So that's what the precast curing is. Um, so it's, it's not quite as high as steam cured. But yeah, you can see at two days, the heat treatments do better. But then at 28 days, the heat treatments do better for the stronger concretes with um, lower water to cementitious um, ratios but not for the weaker concretes. So that's our weakest concrete is the 0.25 water to cementitious material ratio. And we didn't get an advantage. We actually got a disadvantage due to steam carrying at later days. And my final lesson that I learned was that fibers reduced flow. And I, I know that that seems very obvious. I mean, you're adding in these metal um, sticks that aren't, they're not very, optimized for particle packing, right? And so our initial trial mixes, which we are measuring flow for, were done without fibers to save time and save money. But we found that that wasn't giving us the information we really needed to move ahead with designing our concrete, because when we're finally doing the designs, we will be using fibers. And in general, the trend was pretty common. We, we lost about half an inch of flow when we added fibers, but there are a couple outliers and this isn't all the data. So there were some mixes that had a, a bigger decrease when we added fibers than others. And so it was just good to do our trial mixes always with fibers, even though it was sometimes more painful and definitely more expensive, but um, that was the final lesson. So with that, I wanna thank the Florida Department of Transportation for funding the research. Uh, there's Raid and I, that's mix 100 that we did. We did over 150 mixes, but we really celebrated when we hit mix 100. So we took a picture. And then everyone who helped me mix in the lab, Dr. Rollinson, my undergrads, 
and everyone who donated materials to us for this project.